when we, when we would teach macro, when I took it as an undergrad, what you would uh, have really was something like the ISLM model in some version was a, a core notion. Um, often would be something you would build up to, it, but it was certainly kind of everyone took it that that was where you were going to be when you were going to be discussing monetary policy, fiscal policy, uh, and I'm going to talk about ISLM a little bit more uh, in a few minutes. Uh, you you um, didn't necessarily think that that was the end of the story. Some people would dispute it, but it was something that was really certainly in part of everybody's vocabulary. And so this tool got cried out from two directions. So one side was the, the purists. The people who were saying, well, everything must have micro foundations. And this thing, uh, ISLM, is this ad hoc. We sort of say, oh, well, if interest rates fall, people will spend more. And you know, uh, where is this coming from? It, it says, why, we assume that changes in nominal magnitudes are going to have real effects because prices and wages are sticky. Where is that coming from? It should only, we should only do models that are you know, built up from, from basic uh, microeconomic foundations, um, and even though we did uh, manage to keep a lot of the insights from ISLM in models that had enough math to be respectable in grad school, um, the, 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 the simple stuff got sort of driven out of graduate education. And the other side, and this is something for which I have a lot more sympathy, pragmatists. I uh, would say, okay, but you know, who fixes the money supply? Once upon a time, we used to at least talk about doing that, but since the mid-80s, since the mid-80s, um, nobody, monetary policy is not, is not made by setting the money supply. It's made, made by setting short-term interest rates, and so it's very weird to have a model which talks about uh, um, uh, the money supply. Um, and if in, in many respects, that actually is, is right, that we shouldn't even think, most of the time you don't even want to think about that, except it's turned out that in the last five years, it's become very important to actually be back to be, being able to think about quantities here. But between those two, we lost this, and a lot of people were just not ready for this crisis, which has revived uh, the usefulness of this old story. This was uh, John Hicks, and he said, this is what Keynes said. So this was his explanation of what, what uh, Keynes was about. And there's an endless, hopeless dispute about whether this is actually what Keynes was about. So if you actually read the general theory, it's, uh, there's lots of ways to read it. Uh, I always like there's a story about some, uh, someone visiting a, a museum in, in Washington, uh, which you can't do now, uh, but anyway, uh, and looking at a, a portrait of George Washington and asking one of the docents at the museum, is that the way George Washington actually looked? And the docent replied, well, that's the way he looks now. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, so if we're asking, is this what Keynes meant? Then who knows? It's what, it's what he, mean, he, he, me he meant now. <laughs> this, is, this, is <coughs> this is a large part of what we got out of it, which was this actually very, very clever thing uh, on the left side, which is, uh, another way of saying this is that the IS curve is, is saying that the interest rate must be one that matches up desired saving with desired investment. Um, and the LM, LL there, but LM curve is saying that, that the interest rate must be one which makes people willing to hold the quantity of money that's out there. If you ask the question, is the interest rate determined by liquidity preference? Or is it determined by loanable funds, by matching supply and demand for, for savings? And the answer to that question is yes, both simultaneously, which is a very hard thing even now, maybe especially now for people to wrap their minds around, uh, but very subtle point. But then Hicks adding that there's good reason to believe that uh, the left part of that LM curve is very flat. Um, and he was a little bit vague about that, but if we can actually say that, that uh, interest rates really can't go below zero. Um, not strictly true. There have been a couple of occasions very briefly when T-bills have had slightly negative interest rates because they're required for collateral anyway. But you know, basically interest rates can't go below zero because, um, because people can always hold cash, which would then dominate. So, um, so we, we know that there is that, and if 
you should happen to find yourself in a position where that IS curve crosses the flat portion. Alternatively, if you find yourself in a situation where the economy is up against the zero lower bound, then you're on a liquidity trap and weird things happen. And that's why, of course, that's the basic reason this thing has become so relevant, because that's the world we've been living in um, since, since late 2008. What was the problem with this? Why, why did people stop teaching it? Well, in the grad schools, it was because of the purists. A couple of things. One is, you know, just saying, oh, well, people will spend more if the interest rate falls. We sh the argument was you should do, you know, th this, we should have a lot more. That, that's, that's just waving your hands. So let's, let's, let's go out and, and posit that people are behaving rationally and maximizing, because after all, isn't economics supposed to be about maximization? Um, so you have some kind of intertemporal decision making and all of that. Um, and the second, which was the source of the macro wars, there was the whole period of the 70s and the 80s was this bitter dispute about whether it was legit to assume that prices were sticky. It, it is funny, the macro wars, they, they never really ended, uh, but they never really, uh, it, it was sort of a, went into a kind of cold war where people stopped, uh, stopped arguing, they also stopped listening to each other. Um, the, uh, and, and I, I couldn't resist, I have, I have too many slides on this, but one of the things that we've actually gotten a lot of evidence on, if you were wondering about it, is that, that wages in particular really are sticky. If, we were, if you're worried about assuming that, wage, you know, that it's hard to, to, to cut wages, that wages don't fall readily even in the face of large-scale unemployment, we have lots of evidence of that. And i just uh, just show you some of my fun slides. Um, been doing, they've been doing some great work at the San Francisco Fed looking at the distribution of wage changes. And what you find out is that there are a lot of individuals for whom the wage change from last year to this year is zero, just zero. And turns out, when the economy is depressed, a lot higher fraction, precisely zero. That's exactly what you'd expect to see if, if what's happened is a depressed economy, lots of unemployment. In a way, it, in terms of supply and demand, wages should be falling, but fairly hard to cut wages. So that's, you know, we've got very direct evidence of wage stickiness. Um, we also have a bit of evidence from the catastrophe that is Europe. So this is from uh, Alan Taylor and Kevin O'Rourke paper on, on the crisis in the Eurozone. Um, and looking at the, the countries that are a mess, the blue lines are our employment, the red lines are private sector wages. Okay, Spain has 26% you know, unemployment. Ireland has uh, almost 14% unemployment. And Ireland is, you can say Spain, oh, it's regulations, it's unions. Ireland, uh, before the crisis, was supposed to be a highly flexible economy. Uh, but even in Ireland, wages do not fall. It, the only place where you actually see a significant fall in wages is Greece, which shows that if things are catastrophic enough, wages will fall, but they really don't want to fall. Latvia is supposed to be a story of flexibility, um, and yet, even in Latvia, so what you want to look at is the, the green line. Uh, even there, in the face of massive unemployment, wages are flat. And one interesting thing, by the way, on this whole issue of price stickiness and wage stickiness, there was always a fairly large divide between the regular macro guys and the international macro people. Um, international macro people never bought into real business cycle stuff, or most of them did not, because if you looked at the international scene, and in particular if you looked at what happened when exchange rates change, it's just glaringly obvious that a lot of prices are set in domestic currency. So that when exchange rates change, so do relative wages, relative prices. Um, and uh, you see a lot of that in this crisis. So one of the nice things about this is um, we have, I have showed you all of those European countries with terrible economic crises and still wages not falling. And meanwhile, you have Iceland. So this is, this is not a country with a population of Brooklyn. This is a country with a population of one neighborhood in Brooklyn, right? Uh, um, and wages did not fall in Corona, but they fell drastically. Basically, Iceland had a 40% a fall in wages measured in euros because the Corona was devalued. And that's telling you that wages really are sticky in, in, in domestic currencies. This is the um, money supply growth since the mid-80s. And this does not look like a central bank that is setting the money supply. Right. 
Uh, it's wildly erratic, and it's interesting. That period from 85 to 2007 is what's uh, the, is the great moderation. The other thing is, was there a drastic tightening of monetary policy just after the end of, of the uh, official Great Recession? Of course not. On the other hand, if you look at Fed funds rate, here you see what we know, which is, for example, that the big Greenspan cuts to fight the, uh, what, we, what we thought was an economic crisis in the early 2000s. We had no idea, right? Uh, and uh, then the gradual ramping up of interest rates as the economy recovered and the drastic cuts, and then, of course, hitting the zero lower bound uh, where we are today. Um, and one more thing, it, it, which is that uh, you actually were able to do quite well at modeling um, central bank behavior by, in, in terms of, of a Taylor rule, something that related the target interest rate to unemployment and inflation or output gap and in inflation, depending on your preference. Um, and so just pulling up a random chart of, this was actually done uh, early on in, in, in the crisis, so it was more uh, a guess about where things were going to be. Though it was that the uh, estimated Taylor rule relating target interest rates to unemployment and the core inflation rate worked very well. So you could say, let, you know, forget about this LM curve. In fact, forget about the money supply. Let's just do um, things in terms of the interest rate. What actually happened? So the crisis pushed short-term interest rates to zero, then, which is a very strange, you know, it, it's, I, even five, we're, we're almost, I guess we, we hit the zero lower bound around December 2008. So we're almost at the fifth anniversary of hitting, uh, hitting the zero lower bound, which is a very weird world. And many people have still not able to wrap their heads around what that means. Um, one of the things it means, and here's where it didn't actually need the full ISLM, but uh, one of the things that, that it means is that um, that some of the rules on, on uh, the effects of, of fiscal policy change. So there was, back in 2009, a lot of people saying, oh, look at all the amount that the federal government's going to have to borrow. That's going to send interest rates soaring. And actually, if we'd been anywhere near full employment, that probably would have been right. We'd been running deficits that size. Um, and some of those people have now said, well, what we were really worried about was solvency, but that's not the way the argument was originally phrased. The argument was originally, where's the money going to come from? The federal government's going to be borrowing all this. That's going to drive up interest rates, and it's going to um, hurt the economy. Uh, but as, uh, as long as you at least understood that we have you know, something like an IS curve and you have a zero lower bound, you said, hey, no, why will it? The, the Fed won't raise interest rates. Uh, if you ask where does the savings come from, the answer is actually the economy will be stronger than it would otherwise be and some of the extra income will be saved. And all of that falls out of just understanding what the IS curve in ISLM does. Um, so, and that's, you know, that's a pretty big deal actually. Uh, 